of a talk that I gave to my society last night. Unfortunately, the broadband went down, so those tuning in via Zoom didn't get the second half. So I've recorded the whole thing again so that they can listen to the whole thing should they want to. So this talk is all about my astronomy logbook. And the story really starts with this chap, Dick Chambers, who 30 years ago introduced me to astronomy on the beginner's astronomy course at the Crayford Manor House. The beginner's astronomy course was a two-year course, 22 lectures per year, and it covered pretty much everything you needed to know about astronomy. And one of the things that I took away from that was that to be a good amateur astronomer, you need to keep a logbook. And you might ask, well, why do you need to keep a good logbook? What's the point? And the first point would be that it is a contemporary log. And what I mean by that is a log that's taken at the time of the observation. So for instance, if someone finds a supernova and you used to say to them, oh yes, I saw that and I saw it an hour earlier, then they're probably not going to believe you because you don't have any real evidence. Whereas if you've got a log book that shows that you took that observation at that time, then they're more likely to believe your account. It's also a means of documenting your hobby so that you have this book that contains all of your observations and document how and what you've observed over the years. It also allows you to create your own history. So if someone in your family decides to take up astronomy, you can pass on your logbooks to them and they may be something that they treasure. And also you'll be part of a tradition that goes back to cavemen when they were trying to fathom what was happening with the seasons and how the stars affected the weather and through the seasons. And they started documenting on cave walls patterns in the sky to try and understand them. And you'll be part of that tradition. It will also improve your observing because you can take notes about things that went well, things that didn't go well, perhaps filters that work with a particular object but that don't work with a particular object. And you can go back to those logs when you next observe and improve your observing. They can also allow you to understand long-term changes. So things that you observe that you might not notice on a day-to-day um, -day basis, but over years, you might notice that there are changes. These are things like the naked eye limiting magnitude in your area, or um, perhaps the activity on the sun, that sort of thing. They'll also allow you to optimize your time because you'll be able to see what objects you've observed, how long you've observed them for, and in what filters. And if you're lacking in a particular filter, then rather than in the next season starting from scratch again, you can see that you only need to perhaps do one filter and that will um, optimize your time when you're observing so that you get all of the data you need to produce your image or do the science that you want to do. Now, exactly how you create your logbook is something that's a bit of a mystery because I don't recall Dick ever really saying how to create a logbook and what should be in it. I remember him talking about logbooks and I, I definitely remember him imparting on everyone that it was very important to keep a logbook. But I don't really recall him saying particularly much about what should be inside it. Now this guy, Paul Abel, he had some tips that were in the Sky at Night magazine. He suggests that you include all of these factors, so the date and time, the equipment, the seeing conditions, other conditions such as the weather, target specific details, and any personal thoughts. So these seem like a good starting point for any logbook. And uh, just so you know, I have been doing astronomy for 30 years, and I've kept a logbook all of that time here's a recent log and you can see it's a bit of a mess it's quite difficult to read it's inconsistent i'm not able to really quick quickly review anything on this i was going back through my logs trying to work out how many nights i had, had observed in 2022 and i counted backwards the number of nights by looking for the dates on the logbook and i counted the three times and I've got three different answers 
So because of the approach that I've taken with these logbooks, it's particularly difficult to quickly review things. And there's nothing collated, there are no summaries. So it's, you know, you can't quickly look back and see how many times you've observed the sub or a particular object. So let's look at my old logbooks in a little bit more detail and it will add a bit more color to what I've just said. So here are solar observing logs and some nighttime observing logs. Here are some equipment issues and here are some calibration activities. And they're all on the same page. And that's partly why a lot of the things that I've been saying become difficult, you know, collating and understanding and reviewing. All those things become difficult because it's all mashed together. So the information is pretty difficult to access. Things like how often you observe in the day and the night, how many exoplanet transits I've observed, which is something I'm particularly interested in, or what light pollution is like. Is solar activity changing? Have I observed an object before? What altitude was the object when I observed? Was the moon up? What equipment did I use? Did I fix that equipment problem that I had? When did I last pyro align, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All those sorts of questions could be answered by my logbooks, but it's very difficult. So my new logbook needs to address these problems. So I started off by thinking, well, should I go down an analog route, pen and paper, or should I go down a digital route of spreadsheets and databases and images and so on? Well, the pros for the analog route are there are no computers needed. It has a familiarity because I'm already using a logbook. It's the traditional way of doing it. And there is very much a visceral connection with your observing and your logbook because you write it at the time and it does sort of feel like it's part of you. The cons are there is no backup. It's a physical thing. There is only one of it. It's not easy to share for the same reasons. You know, it's a physical thing. I'd have to post it to people to share it or photograph it to share it. Um, and another con is how you actually combine different types. I've looked at lots of different examples of logbooks and all the examples I've seen are very specific to the objects that you're trying to view. They're also often focused quite a bit around drawing of objects, um, which is not something that I actually do a lot of. And here are just a few examples of those sort of analog approaches to logbooks. Pros for a digital approach would be the potential for automation. It's easy to share, it's digital information. So it's very easy. It's easy to search for the same reasons. And the majority of my observing is digital. I image, I mainly do photometry, but I'm using digital equipment to do that. And files are produced um, that I could use to create a logbook. One of the problems with that is the potential for proprietary formats and for the potential for there to be lots of files. I don't want to store anything in a format that in 10 years time is not going to be accessible anymore because the software for logging an observation is no longer available, it doesn't work on your latest operating system. And often with a lot of these files, and databases, you end up with not one file, but lots of files. And therefore there's an opportunity for those files to be corrupted or go missing. So, so I decided to go down the route of an analog logbook. And here is my logbook. I'll talk a bit more about this. So the concept is I want to use forms because I want to get more consistent capture of information. But to do that, I need to split the logbook into a nighttime logbook and a solar logbook. So there'll be separate logbooks for those two sorts of observing. I'm also going to have an equipment logbook where all of the equipment setup and issues and calibration logs will be stored. And then I'm going to have two summary logs, one for deep space objects, and one is more of a sort of a long term summary of everything. So if we just look at this in a little bit more detail, this is what my nighttime logbook looks like. 
Now, all the information in green is the information that Paul Abel suggested should be captured as a minimum. I also capture astronomical twilight and night times, moon phase and altitude, object altitude, temperature and dew point, naked eye limiting magnitude, and post observation notes, as well as all those other things like the contemporary notes, the objects you've observed, the subs, the filters, the scope, the scene, day and time, etc. And here's one of those forms filled in. Now, the first thing is there's one night per page, so it makes it a lot easier just to count up pages to see how many nights you observed this month or last year or whatever. And um, you can see that it's a lot prettier to look at, despite my right handwriting still being pretty ugly. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail. If we look at the top part, which is the graphical part of the logbook, we have the date that the observation took place. This is always the pre-midnight date. And then we have this graph here. The graph, the background, the blue in the background shows astronomical twilight and nighttime. The yellow here shows the altitude of the moon. Here we have the phase and the age of the moon, the temperature and the dew point, the focus, and then these red lines show the altitude of the objects that I've been I've set up to observe, and then what these objects are. So you can see that roughly the times that I was observing them and what their altitude was and how all that relates to the altitude of the moon and the darkness of the sky. I then have a little chart here which helps me with um, assessing the naked eye limiting magnitude. Now, I, I do this now, this is an early one, I do this now for a number of different places in the sky, so I end up with a range here rather than a single number, um, but that's neither here nor there really. If we look at the bottom half of the form, this is where I log what I'm planning to observe. As you can see how I was planning to observe the exoplanet transit Qatar 3b, the exoplanet transit Hat P 62b and the comet 62p. You can see the um, integration or sorry, the exposure times that I was going to be doing. I haven't written in the number of exposures because I, I tend to do that afterwards because um, Nina manages the exposures for me. The filters I use, the telescopes I use, and then here are the object um, specific information that Paul Abel suggested you capture. So um, for the exoplanets, we've got the magnitude, the depth of the transit, how long the transit is. So you have to add another two hours on because it's an hour before and an hour after. And then the distance to the moon. And I've made a note here that I also manually focused for these. And then on the night, when I'm setting up, I write some notes. You can see here, I said that it's looking very clear tonight. The forecast suggested no, cap, no cloud all night. So I set up on these objects. Um, the comet position in NINA was completely wrong, so I used the RA and depth calculated by my planetarium software. And then I write in some post-observation notes when I close the observatory in the morning, and um, I put little markers by these so that they relate to the markers here. So you can see that I had a camera download failure at 3.50, so I didn't get the comet, so that was a complete failure. Um, that the Qatar 3B one, I got the transit, but it wasn't accepted due to cloud. I had less than half of the transit. And then HAT P 62B, I did get a result for, and I had to remove some four frames. So I've got quite a lot of information on how successful the observation was, what I planned to observe, what the conditions were, and so on. And I do this for every night I observe. Now, I guess one of the things to note here is, whilst it is in this logbook, this isn't the camera download failure isn't something that um, I rely on my nighttime logbook to um, keep track of. I put that into my equipment logbook. So let's have a quick look at the equipment logbook. See so the equipment logbook, 
I have some pages which describe the setup of my equipment. So here I've got details about the mount, details about the focuser, such as the um, critical focus in steps and in microns, the filters and the positions of those filters, the camera details. And then I've got some information here about how it all physically connects together. And I have that for each of my setups. I then have some calibration records. So I record when I took flats, why I took new flats, etc. Do the same for polar alignment, the same for guiding calibration. So it's all in the one book, all listed together, all easy to access. And then I have uh, the rest of the book is dedicated to problems. So when I, when I um, get a problem, I start a new page, I include the date, what the problem is, and what I've tried to do to fix it. And this was a camera crashing stroke download issue that uh, if you do much observing, you'll know these things can take months, sometimes years, to really get to the bottom of what the problem is. And um, this was one of those times where I had this intermittent issue or I had to keep changing things and fiddling with cables and so on until I resolved the problem. I have actually resolved it now. It wasn't resolved at this point, but it has now been completely resolved. But it allows me to keep all of one problem all together, even though it has taken months to resolve. That means that I don't end up having to, I don't end up forgetting what I've done, re retrying things over and over, which I have done in the past, because whilst all these logs would have been in a log book, because they're all on different pages and all potentially even in different log books, it's very difficult therefore to sort of track an issue. And by having them all on one page, it makes it really easy. That has been a, a real bonus of having this log book system that I've set up. So let's have a quick look at the summary log books. We'll start with the deep space object summary log book. So the way this works is I have, when I observe a deep space object, fuzzy, then I put it, as well as being in my nighttime logs, which shows what I observed that night, it also goes into my deep space, observation, deep space object log. And this log book just has a page for each object and I have some information about the object. I have position. I have what it's like in particular filters. I have a little histogram of when I've taken um, images of the object, a list of the ob times that I've taken the object, and then the duration in hours I've taken in different filters. And then I also have a little chart here showing when it's at its best what the altitude is in that month or mid that month, basically, um, and what the sky conditions are. So he, so January is pretty much night time from uh, 6 p.m. all the way through to 6 a.m. And then I have a little space here for some notes should I need them. And this logbook allows me to go back and say, look at this particular object, NGC 2403, um, which is a spiral galaxy, and I can look at it and I can go, okay, let's get some more luminance images. Let's not worry about the green. Let's get a little bit more red, a little bit more blue, um, and then I'll have enough data to produce an image. Let's now have a quick look at my solar observing log. This logbook is dedicated to solar observing. It has all the information that I need in order to report my observations to the BAA solar section. And it also tracks my process for taking the images, stacking them, processing them, and publishing them. So everything's there just go through this and with an example so I have the date at the top I have the solar coordinate parameters here so we've got the Carrington number 
the LO, VO and P numbers. I then have the time that I took some video. I have two setups, one that takes the whole disk and one that takes zoomed in images of particular active regions. You can see here that I took the whole disk at 8.27 and 8.30. I stacked them both. The results of those stacks meant that I only actually processed one, which is the 8.30 image, and that was the image that I published. I then, uh, 3429 must have been quite a nice um, active region, so I took an image of that at 8.46 and again at 9.03. It was the 903 one that I ended up publishing. And um, what I then do using my um, processed image on the whole disk, I categorize all of the groups on the disk and I count how many sunspots there were, and if they were in the north or the south, what the Zurich number is, what the Q number is, and then any notes. And that then allows me to tally everything up to create the GN, the FN, the GS, the FS, the relative sunspot number and the quality number. So this is groups north, spots north, groups south, spots south. And then I have some information here about the seeing and just some other notes. And then I have a little diagram here, which just pictorially shows these positions here. Um, but it also includes on it a, a little sketch of each of the of each of these sunspot sunspot groups. Um, so I've got a, a rough idea of where they were on the disk. Uh, then my long term summary log is looking at um, answering some of those questions that I have the answers for in my existing log books, but they're almost impossible to actually get out of the log book. So have I observed a particular object again? How many times have I observed an object? Is the light pollution getting worse? Is the sun more or less active this month? What month do I do most of my observing in? Those sorts of questions that would be nice to answer all go into the summary logbook. And this is the summary logbook. I, I, what I've found with it is there are things that I'm recording in it that I don't now think are particularly useful and when I come back to redoing the summary logbook I will probably get rid of those things and add other things but so it's, I guess it's in that respect it's a living document it will change next time I need to print it out when I finish when I fill up this book it's designed to last nine years this book um, and when I when I fill it out I will do things slightly different next time it's not set in stone so here you can see the nights I observed in 2023 and the days I observed in 2023. And we also have what the naked eye limiting magnitude was. So the, the monthly logbook, or, or sorry, the summary logbook, I tend to update once a month. I wait to the end of the month and then I update it. So here you've got my average naked eye limiting magnitude records. And then I have a histogram of all my naked eye limiting magnitude measurements and then they're colored in um, with respect to if the moon was full crescent or below the horizon i'm just doing this just to see you know the will i'll end up with a histogram of what my observing conditions are generally like plus a bar chart of what my observing conditions are like and then for the sun we have the quality number and the relative sunspot number these measure basically the activity of the sun. They both do the same thing. So we would expect them over 11 years to show that 11 year cycle and for it to be very similar, but they do count slightly differently as you can see. Um, so I'm hoping here to actually produce that 11 year, or this is only nine years on this chart, but it will produce, I'm hoping to, to demonstrate the 11 year cycle with my own observations. I then have a little log that allows me to just record the Messier and Caldwell objects that I've observed and how many times I've observed them. Um, I'm not sure this is really of that much value. I think I'll probably get rid of this when I redo this book in eight years time. 
And then I have a little histogram here showing phases of the moon that I've observed. Now, I have done lots of lunar observing. This doesn't really reflect it it's because this logbook only goes from 2023 and I've been focused on other things. I haven't really done a great deal of lunar work recently, but this here over the years will fill out with um, all of the lunar 100 objects, other features on the moon and all of the phases. And it will help me plan, for instance, if I've got a gap in the phases that I haven't observed, then I can I know that that's a you know it's worth prioritising observing that phase so that I get every phase of the moon recorded. I then have here a list of all the deep sky objects I've observed when I observed them, what filters I observed them in. I'm not sure that this either is that useful, so I think I'll probably get rid of this. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just got eight years to decide, so I'm, I might change my mind, but at the moment I'm not really thinking it has a great deal of value. Then have here the a bar chart of the exoplanets that I've observed, um, which is the total height of these charts, and then the green ones are the ones that were successful. You can see that in November I did 14 exoplanet transits, but only five were successful. Most of the reasons these fail are because of the weather in the UK. It's just, it starts clear and it goes cloudy. You don't get enough data. Um, and when you get months with worse and worse weather, then you tend to, well, I, I tend to think, well, I'll give it a go. I know it's not likely to be successful, but I'll give it a go anyway. Um, and that then makes these numbers look much worse because I get more and more failures because I'm taking a punt off than on it being good. And though, though, those, those opportunities generally fail. And then I have here, it's just a scatter chart. I have the um, host stars magnitude here against the transit depth here. I just thought I would do this for successful transits to give me an idea of um, are there, you know, with bright objects, can I only get deep transits or can I get the really faint transits as well? Um, with dim objects, can I get faint transits and as well as deep transits? Just trying to sort of see where the objects that I'm successful are lie in this phase space. So that will be interesting to see as this fills out with more and more transits. I then have my exoplanet log, which lists all of the exoplanet transits that I've attempted. And if they were successful, then what the O minus C was. And if they failed, what reasons they failed. It's sort of interesting, almost always. It, they were clouded out. And this started putting little um, emoticons in. And this is where I had 100 transits, I've got a little party popper, and that sort of thing, just to sort of make it a bit more colourful. And then I have um, some pages for transient objects. So this is anything that moves in the sky, so planets, comets, and supernova mainly. Um, anything that moves in the sky, I log in here. Then in the back of my long-term log, I have some information that I find useful. So I have the description of the Borkin scale. I then have a naked eye limiting magnitude chart for Ursa Minor. Um, so I can count the stars in Ursa Minor and then read off what the limiting magnitude is. I have the same for summer with this part of Cygnus and then the same for the Orion star counts. All these colors incidentally relate to this Borkin scale and I, I live in um, Greater London and it's always um, between eight, seven and eight. It's normally eight to be honest, occasionally, rarely it pushes into seven. There's pretty poor skies, but I'm observing. 
I then have a, a, a similar chart which describes areas of the sky between prominent stars that um, if you count the number of stars, you can uh, read off this chart here, what the limiting magnitude is. That's quite a nice thing to have. And then I have a chart for calculating the Zurich number. Uh, on the BAA website, they have this as um, a number of paragraphs of uh, prose, I guess, or not of prose, but paragraphs of just writing, a description. Um, I've tried to tabulate it because I find it easier to, to read off than reading through a wordy description. And then I have some information on the solar observing uh, scale that's used by the British Astronomical Association for the solar section, because it's completely different to um, other scales that are used for nighttime observing. Um, the formula for calculating the relative distance what number, that sort of thing. I, I generally remember most of this stuff, but especially with the sun, I start losing the sun because of my local horizon in around November, and I don't really gain it again until April. So you get a big gap in the year when I don't observe the sun. When you go back to it, having had a four month gap of observing, you sometimes need a little reminder as to um, how to calculate the Zurich or how to work out what the Zurich number is, for instance, or the quality number, that sort of thing. And then I just have a little um, page on the seeing scale. And I uh, say so this is work in progress. Things are changing all the time. So I've started where I've observed a particular object at M3 here. I uh, That resulted in me creating an image. So I've stuck the image into the book um, because I didn't want to cover what I'd written. I just stuck it on the edge. And then this one, M42, is a very quick image, so I just stuck it in the book. And I just printed these out on a um, sticky back printer, inkjet paper. And then here's another example where I've put in the transit um, that I uh, achieved when I observed Gaia 2B. Um, so I'm just, I guess, making the books a little bit more interesting to look at by including some of these results in the books. And that's it. So there obviously aren't any questions. You can leave questions in the comments of this video if you want to ask questions and I'll, I'll answer them. Um, but that was the talk that I gave at my local astronomical society as part of our society night, which is something that we do about once a month. We meet once a week, um, normally for professional lectures but about once a month, maybe every six weeks, we have been called a society night where we go through society business and members have an opportunity to give little talks like this one. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a thumbs up and um, I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.